Notre Dame fans, welcome to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Mailbag Podcast. This is a live edition, and today uh, we're going to focus on Notre Dame defense and Notre Dame defensive recruiting. Uh, we can talk about anything that you guys want to talk about when it comes to the Notre Dame defense. It can be about players coming back. It can be about the draft. It can be about whatever you want. Just try to stick to defense, and then we'll talk about defensive recruiting. Now, if you have some questions you really want to get answered about the team or about the, re- the offensive recruiting, feel free to ask them, and if I have time at the end, I'll try to get to them. So uh, before we begin with questions, I do want to talk about defensive recruiting a little bit. And the, the thing I want to point out is the position that Notre Dame is right now at linebacker recruiting. This is a position that, to me, in the 2022 class – is an absolute must for Notre Dame. Not only do they need numbers, I think they need at least three. I think you can make a case that they need four linebackers in this class, but they need impact talent. I mean, you look at the last two years, Notre Dame really has only signed one linebacker unless Keanu Kia decides he wants to not go on his mission and enroll at Notre Dame. But even then, you've signed two linebackers in in two years. None of the linebackers in the 2019 class have really panned out just yet. doesn't mean they won't. It just means just yet. And the 2018 class is, is going to be gone. Most of it's going to be gone by the time this class shows up. So striking out a linebacker in 2020 and then only signing Prince Colley, who's outstanding, by the way, in 2021 means you need numbers and you need talent in the 2022 class at linebacker. Notre Dame already has Nolan Ziegler, who I believe is very a very underrated player. He's finally been bumped up. I believe he's now a consensus four-star recruit. When they fir- he first committed, I believe he was a consensus three-star recruit. I graded him out as a four-star. That's starting to change now that people have watched his junior film in Michigan. Really like Nolan Ziegler. That's a great place to start. Right now, Notre Dame is also, I would argue, the leader based on the sources I've talked to for Josh Burnham, who's a linebacker from Michigan. Now, when it comes to kids like him, until he commits publicly, I'm not going to feel great about it just because – those in-state kids we saw with Braden McGregor, there was a lot of people thought he was going to go to Notre Dame. He ended up going to Michigan. For me, I just want to see him pull the trigger first. Now, if, if he does, great pickup. I really like Josh Burnham. He's a raw kid. He's 6'4", 6'3", 6'4", listed as both. Tremendous wingspan, incredibly long arms. Right now, he's just a raw football player. He's not a really technically sound guy. Uh, he's a prospect that, in my opinion, needs a lot of coaching. But you just can't you can't coach some of the things that he has, which is great length, really athletic player, really good feet. You can see him at quarterback when he's running the ball. He's a powerful, athletic young man. He just has to learn to be more of a of a linebacker, and that'll come in time, you know. And obviously, as he gets more experience playing linebacker and gets good coaching, which I think he'll get at Notre Dame, should he pick Notre Dame which again, as I'm saying, is not a given yet. I feel really good about where Notre Dame is right now, but we need to see it. So I I like where they are there. I think Notre Dame is, in my opinion, based on my sources, the leader uh, for junior Tui Alamaka, who's a middle linebacker from California, another guy that I absolutely love. He's only about six one and a half, but he's thick, he's physical, he's he's got really good length beyond a normal six one guy, but he's a he's a thumper in the box. He's got some range to him, so he's not just a, a B gap to B gap middle linebacker. I think he's smart in coverage, and I think he's a guy that that could also be a bit of an edge rusher. He could be a drop type of player. He reminds me a lot in that regards of Jordan Badelho. So there's certainly some flexibility to what he could bring to your to your defense. I think Burnham projects as sort of a Mike Will. I think Tui Alamaka projects as more of a Mike. So when you when you look at him, I, I like that combination. Ziggler's more of an outside player, a rover, a will kind of player. And then if you're able to land those two guys, which I think they lead, I also think Notre Dame leads for Sebastian Cheeks, although that one is still a down-the-road thing. He, From talking to one of my sources last night, it sounds like he wants to wait until after he plays his junior season, which is supposed to be this spring if they have football in, uh, um, in Illinois. So he wants to commit before senior year, but – we need to see kind of that progress a little bit. So um, I really like that group. And then there's Devin Jackson from uh, Nebraska, from the same high school as Xavier Watts. He's an interesting player. I've got to watch more film of him. Here, here's my thoughts on Devin Jackson. I think he is an exceptional athlete. And, and I think he is a guy that you recruit just because of his athleticism alone. But, but here's my problem. 
he's more of an edge rusher right now. And, and we don't really see him do a lot of linebacker things. At least we didn't on sophomore film. He didn't get a chance to play as a junior because for some reason, even though most of Nebraska played football, his particular district did not allow them to play football last year. So I need to see him do some linebacker things. I love the athleticism. And the problem is he's not really a drop linebacker because I don't think he necessarily has the size to be a drop linebacker. So I need to see how he fills out. I need to see him play linebacker. If Notre Dame decides to take him, there's some risk there. I think there's a lower floor with Devin Jackson, but it would also be a, a, a pick that I wouldn't have a problem with because there's a very high ceiling with this kid. I think there's a lot of athleticism. There's a lot of twitchiness there. There's a lot of explosiveness there. If they think they can get him to fill out or if they think he can play linebacker, then you do it. And if you do take Jackson and, and he can't play linebacker every down, at the very least, you have a guy that can be an edge rusher in a nickel package. I mean, and I think Marcus Freeman's going to be using sub packages a little bit more than we saw from Clark Lee. So I think that is a situation where you're going to at least get value from him, even if he can't pan out as an every down linebacker. So I think right now, Notre Dame is in great position when it comes to 2022 uh, linebacker recruiting. Brandon Plencher uh, says, um, Let's see here. Just went away. Uh, love Burnham. Hope uh, hope he commits soon. Um, need needs to come visit. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I I don't know if if he's going to commit anytime soon. I've heard some rumblings from a couple different sources that he may decide by the end of the month. But I know Michigan right now is trying to keep him from making a decision because I think they know that if he made a decision right now, it, it may not work out well for them. So they're just trying to get him to not make a decision and hold off. So. I love where Notre Dame is at right now when it comes to linebacker recruiting. They've got themselves with some top players. Jalen Sneed is a is a top 50 recruit, in my opinion. He likes Notre Dame. Harold Perkins is a five-star recruit. Recruit He likes Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman. There's a lot of players to choose from, a linebacker. Now, the key now is going to be Coach Freeman has to close, and that's going to be the next step for, uh, for Notre Dame. So uh, I like where they're at. I think that's a great place, and that, to me, from a combination of volume plus talent, I think is the most important position in the 2022 class. Now, you could argue they need a top corner. Uh, I get that. But they don't have a need for numbers at corner. They signed three corners in 2020. They signed four in 2021. Notre Dame is good from a number standpoint at corner. They just need a high-level player. Toriano Pride, Jaden Gould, guys like that. You know, I think they need an impact talent, not so much numbers. I think at linebacker, it's both. You need numbers and you need top level talent. So far, they're in position to, to get that, but now they they have to go out and finish and, and get it. So let's try to dive into some of these questions. This is sort of a general recruiting question from Double BB88. A player, I imagine that's a shout out to Bobby, uh, Bobby Brown. I would take it. A player gets a football scholarship from Notre Dame. Is this a literal four year scholarship or is it rolled over year to year if a player does not meet expectations? Or are they encouraged to transfer? So the way that no, this is varies from team to team and conference to conference. More more conferences are starting to go to more of the four year guaranteed contract. The SEC, for example, does not have four. It's it's not essentially a four year guaranteed contract, which is essentially what a scholarship is. It's a contract. We're offering you a a scholarship. We're going to pay for your room and board. Um, I I don't know if all schools are still doing full cost of attendance, but I I know that for Notre Dame, I believe that most things they get paid for. Although there's still some areas where Notre Dame can give more from a scholarship area, which I'd like to see them do more. But Notre Dame says, essentially, as long as you abide by the regulations of the institution, you know, academically, you have to meet certain standards. Socially, you have to meet certain standards. You know, don't do things that get you kicked out of school. But it doesn't matter how good of a football player you are or are not. You can't just be kicked out or, or have your scholarship removed because you're not a good football player. Does that mean Notre Dame doesn't try to encourage kids to transfer? Of course they do. And and. I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to encourage a kid to transfer as long as you do it honestly and openly. What I don't like is when I hear stories about how, you know, staff is maybe harder on a kid or, or they, and this isn't just Notre Dame specifically. I've, I've heard this, but I, it's not very often where they'll say, Hey, look, they'll make life miserable for you to the point where you want to transfer. And, and, and I don't like that. I think be honest with a kid. Say, Hey, look, you know, right now we have these young players that are going to pass you up. We don't think you're going to get a chance to play. If you want to transfer, we'll do everything we can to help you and find a place for you. I would like to see that kind of be what coaches do in general. Uh, and I do know that Notre Dame has done that several times. They've been honest with the kids and said, hey, look, 
you know, you're not really in our plans. So if you want to transfer, go for it. And, and I appreciate that. And if in, in some most cases, those players decide to stay because they're like, well, I'm just going to still get my degree and then go transfer somewhere afterwards. So uh, it's a little harder for Notre Dame to, you know, push kids out in that regards, as long as those kids are abiding by school policy. So that's that's essentially how it works. And, and that's one advantage SEC teams have is that they can basically tell a kid, we're not honoring your scholarship next year because, you know, it's it's basically a series of four one-year contracts. All right, AJ says, uh, just saw a picture of JoJo Johnson on Twitter and he looks physically ready uh, to play already. Uh, will he be will he be playing offense or defense? JoJo is going to play defense for Notre Dame. So when we've we've talked about this in the past. It's a really an interesting story because he was originally a wide receiver recruit. I saw him in the summer of I think 2019 at Notre Dame camp, and I I wrote about him at the time. I was somewhere else, and I wrote about him because I really liked what I saw from him, but. He wasn't the biggest guy in the world, and I don't think he was dynamic enough at the time to say, hey, this is a guy Notre Dame needs to go get, especially when you look at the quality of the talent that Notre Dame was recruiting at the time. But I loved his feet, and I really liked his competitiveness, and he was a really nice kid. And and then so he, he kind of goes about his business. He's sort of a middle-level receiver recruit. Well, then Cincinnati and Marcus Freeman convinced him, you know, you, you should be a defensive player. And so he committed to Cincinnati when Marcus Freeman was there as a defensive player. Well, then he started focusing more and more on defense. And as he started to focus more on defense, more bigger schools like Notre Dame started to talk to him and they were interested in him. So then, of course, Notre Dame eventually offers him and signs him, which was a huge pickup. And then after that, Marcus Freeman comes on as the defensive coordinator. So I, I like how that story worked out, but uh, is he going to be ready to play? I think JoJo athletically could play as a freshman. I don't think that physical issues are are going to be there for JoJo. The issue is he's still really raw as a defensive back, really raw. When you watch him in high school as a senior, everything he did was just on God-given ability. There are a lot of things he has to learn from a technical standpoint before I think he's going to be ready to play at a place like Notre Dame. Now, that doesn't mean he won't be able to play as a freshman. It just means between the time he finished his senior year to the time the Notre Dame season starts, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, he has to learn those things. And once he learns those things, I think JoJo will have a chance to compete at Notre Dame because he has a level of speed and, and foot quickness and agility and overall athleticism that they don't really have. Uh, he's sort of the he's sort of the only other corner on the roster, in my opinion, that that is a similar player to Tariq Bracy. So there's a need for that. So I, I do think he could play as a freshman physically. It's just, but that's not going to be the issue. If JoJo doesn't play this year. It's not because he lacks the physical talent. It's that he lacks the technical skill because he still he hasn't played corner very long. So I think that would be the thing that would keep him. And it's a really deep depth chart now. Uh. Thomas Walsh asks another kind of recruiting question I'm going to ask answer now while we're still kind of talking general. Once an offer goes out to a kid and he commits like QB Steve Angeli, yesterday, can the school not accept it without looking bad or breaking some rule? Uh, look, there's no rule that says you have to honor a scholarship offer. I, you, the only time you have to honor a scholarship offer legally or by rule is when the kid signs. I mean, that that's it. Schools do this all the time. They offer kids all the time and say, hey, look, we're offering you, but it's, you know, we're not ready to accept a commitment just yet. We just wanted you to know that we like you. We're in there with you. We're going to do some more research. And so here's an offer. Some kids have a scholarship offer that if it, it look, anytime you want it, it's yours. And so you can you can do that. I think as long as you're honest with a kid, it, it usually works out. I mean, Steve Angeli knew that for a long time that he had an offer from Notre Dame, but it, he couldn't just pick up the phone and call and, and commit. That didn't happen until this week. So schools do that all the time. That's just part of the recruiting. I think the schools that I respect are the ones that are honest with kids. And, and that happens quite a bit. It's it's not always, but there, there are plenty of times where kids know where they stand with, with these coaches. All right, DBZ, let's talk some Notre Dame defense. Can Simon, Shane Simon break out this year and have a monster season? If so, should he stay at Buck? Uh, look, I think... I think it, I've been very critical of Shane Simon the last year uh, from a production standpoint. He was not a good linebacker for Notre Dame this year. Having said that, 
I, my opinion of him has not changed from a physical talent standpoint. I mean, he was one of my five highest ranked recruits in the 2018 class. And in my opinion, coming out of high school, that was arguably Notre Dame's best recruiting class since 2013. It was a very talented class. A lot of guys haven't panned out, but athletically and lengthwise, it was a, it was a great class. I think the thing with, with Shane Simon has, has been just mentally, he hasn't, shown the instincts and feel for the position that you really want and I think that's the thing that has really held Shane Simon back is is that part now that light goes on at different times for different players if you'd have told me before the 2019 season that Asmar Bilal was going to have 70 plus tackles for loss and or 70 plus tackles and 10 tackles for loss I'd have said you're out of your mind Asmar Bilal never showed the instincts to be a, a really good college linebacker ever until he did as a fifth year senior. So if Asmar Bilal can do it, there's no reason for me to think that Shane Simon can't do it. And the thing about Shane Simon is I would argue that he's an even better athlete than Asmar Bilal was. And, and that's saying something because I thought Asmar was a, was a, a pretty good linebacker. And so I, I certainly think the light can go on. And if it does go on, it's going to be a big time breakout because the athleticism is there. I mean, there's a lot of talent there with Shane Simon, and he just needs to to be able to play looser, play more free, be more instinctive. He uh, he is about one of the easiest linebackers that I saw at the Power Five level to block. And it's not because he lacks athleticism; it's because he doesn't quite understand really how to comfortably play the position, partly because he kept moving around so much. He was Rover, Buck, Mike, Rover, you know, back to Buck. He's now a Buck. I mean, and it's now called a Will in Marcus Freeman's defense. So do I do I predict that he'll have a breakout season? No, because I, I need to see it. But would it shock me? No, because I think he's a better player. And he was more productive, I would argue, as an inside linebacker than Asmar Bilal ever was. So I think it's capable of it, and, and, it, and it needs to happen. I mean, he is a very athletically talented player, and he could be a difference maker in this defense. And especially as aggressive as Marcus Freeman likes to be with his linebackers, to have a six foot three, 230-pound, long-armed, really athletic kid playing that will position be huge for this defense. So uh, I don't know if it'll happen or not, but if it does, it could be it could be a game changer for the Notre Dame defense. There's there's no question about it. Frank Anthony, love the podcast. Frank, I appreciate it. I know you follow us on on Facebook, buddy. I really appreciate you uh you you listening and and watching and and reading our stuff. All right. Samuel Ramirez says Notre Dame is in great position in linebacker recruiting with Cheeks Jackson Burnham and uh uh, Tui Alamaka, if you could only take three to play with Ziggler, who would you pick and why? That kind of follows up on my my question, my my thing from earlier. If I could only take three of them, I would take Cheeks, Burnham, and, and Tui Alamaka. And the reason for that is, even though you could make a case that Jackson's the best athlete of all of them, the reason I would take the other three is because I know those guys can play linebacker. I'm not. I'm still not sold that Jackson can. So if I had to pick, and again, at some point in time in recruiting, you have to pick. You have a lot of players you really like. You can only take so many. Those would be the three that I would take. Would I I criticize Notre Dame for taking Jackson? Absolutely not, because I get it. I see the athleticism. It's impressive. And he's a highly ranked kid. So if they took him and they wanted to take a chance and a flyer on his athleticism, go for it. But for me, when I have multiple talented players on the board, I want to take the guys that I feel more comfortable with being able to play at that position, more certainty playing in that position. Now, would I take a guy that I thought was an average talent but knew how to play the linebacker position over Jackson? No way. I'm taking – the only reason I'm, I'm saying I wouldn't take Jackson is because I think the other three guys that you mentioned are all top 100 caliber talents as well. And, and again, I'm not talking about how they're ranked. They are ranked that way. I'm talking about how I see their talent. To me, they're top 100 caliber talents on my grading scale. So there's a similarity between all of them. So to me, you take the guys that have more certainty that position. But again, it's one of those things where you're picking between really, really good prospects. And I don't think there's a wrong answer. I, I, you know, I, I, I hope Samuel, that that kind of answers your question because yes, I would take this three, but the way I also view it is I don't think there's a wrong trio that Notre Dame could take of that group. And then if you throw Jalen Sneed and you throw in Harold Perkins, literally, 
I'm at the position where if you're asking me to pick my top three, I could tell you what my top three are. But there's not a guy that they could take in any combination, any three, three combination of those guys that I'd look at and say anything but great pickup, if, if that kind of answers your question. Um, so uh, Tommy Leonard asked, does that junior stand for Manti Jr.? When talking about uh, uh, Tui Alamaka goes by Junior Tui Alamaka. Um, no, but it could. He certainly has a lot of skills. I, you know, I think the Manti comparisons are, are really – are, are really on point just because body type wise, you know, Manti wasn't a real tall guy, but had good length. Manti was a real thick guy. I think Junior's a real thick guy. I think both of them are incredibly instinctive. Here's the thing I like about Junior Tui Alamak on film. He is a six, one and a half, 230 plus pound kid who's got a really thick body. But the thing that makes him unique, and this is what separates the great linebackers from the good linebackers is not only does he have talent and, and tools and all that, but his ability to kind of get through little narrow holes is, is unique. And Manti had that, especially as he got older, where you're know, like, how'd that big bodied guy get through that little hole? Because it's instincts, it's timing, it's, it's technique, it's athleticism. And so he is a natural linebacker. And uh, he, he he's just a really talented player and a guy that I, I think is going to draw a lot of Manti tail comparisons. Normally, I try to avoid those, and I would avoid them in regards to predicting that Junior's going to go out and be a Heisman Trophy finalist and have seven interceptions. But if you're just talking about sort of a uh, comparing their skill set, then I think that, that there's a lot of natural similarities. Uh, stadium rankings as who's Notre Dame's biggest threat to uh, to New to Alamaka. I would argue Texas, and the reason I say that is I think Notre Dame leads for him, and and I'd be a little surprised if he doesn't pick Notre Dame. But it's not a done deal because he's not publicly committed at this point in time. I think that that it's not going to be Stanford. I'd be shocked if it's Stanford. I think it's going to be a because I don't think he really cares about staying close to home. I think it's about Texas right now is a really hot program on the recruiting trail. And since they brought in the new staff, they have made him a big priority. And I always worry about the late comers that have a really unique product to sell. And when you look at Texas right now, it's a brand new staff. There's literally no criticism you can make of the job they've done at Texas. Their new head coach just won a national championship, turning Mac Jones into a first round talent, right? So they're a hot program. And and we saw you know, we saw this with with Brian Kelly in his first year. I mean, you look at the 2011 class; they signed three five star defensive ends his first full class, and that was after Notre Dame had gone eight and five. Imagine what it's like for a guy like Steve Sarkeesian, who hasn't coached a game yet, and the success he had was great. So that's to me is would be the program that I'd be most concerned with right now. I don't know if that's considered the what other people would predict, but based on what I know of the situation and just how I know recruiting goes. I think that that would be the team that that I would be would be most uh, most concerned about. There was a question here about Jalen Sneed that I <clears throat> Brandon Plencher asks: uh, Would they take Sneed with four linebackers already committed? Brandon, I, I you know what I think I don't know what the staff would do. Uh, the, here's here's the issue that you have: you have to juggle what your needs are at other positions because you can only take so many players. Notre Dame is going to have to get back to eighty five unless the NCAA changes and gives. So right now, the, these schools are in a unique situation. In 2021, they can have as many scholarship players as they want. Because of the COVID year gr year of eligibility they granted, you know that's why Kurt Heinisch can come back. So there is no scholarship limit. As of right now, the plan is going to be that by 2022, so just one year, you have to be back down to 85. There are some trying to push for the NCAA to kind of slowly walk it back a little bit. So maybe you're at 90 in 2022, then get to 85, something like that. If the NCAA makes a rule allowing them to be a 90, then yeah, you load up. But right now, there's a lot of uncertainty about that. And there are other positions where volume is needed. Now, let's just say Notre Dame gets in a situation where they get a corner and a safety they really like, and they feel like maybe one of the current corners can move to safety and be a starting caliber player. So they say, hey, look, we're only going to take two DBs in this class because we've loaded up the last couple years of corner. We signed two safeties last year. We're going to move one of those corners over, something along those lines. And they wanted to use one of those positions to go to, to linebacker. Then I'd say you have that conversation. Let's say that they wanted to take three receivers, but right now receiver recruiting isn't looking great. 
So do you take three good players or because you missed out on all the best players, which is what it's looking like right now, unless things change, or do you say, look, we're not going to meet our need. We, we didn't get it done in recruiting receivers this year. So we're going to take two and that's going to allow us at least be good numbers wise. We'll, we'll take one of those receiver scholarships and put it towards next year, but then we'll use that third scholarship. We had allotted for there and we'll move it to linebacker because we feel we can load up. That's the first thing you have to look at. The second thing you have to look at in a situation like this, Brandon, is can you play all these guys together? I mean, if you take five linebackers that can only play Mike or Buck, then you've wasted some scholarships because you're not going to play five inside linebackers week after week, not in one class. So then you say, well, can guys play different positions? Okay, can Nolan Ziegler be a rover? Can Jalen Sneed be a rover? Can Junior Tui Alamaka maybe eventually move to drop end if you if you feel the need there? So if you have at least two or three of those guys that can be versatile, let's say you take Devin Jackson, for example, and, and maybe he grows into that, that drop position, or maybe you like to use him more of an edge rusher than a pure linebacker, then you may say, we'll take that, that extra guy because that we have enough versatility that you can use all these guys together. That's how I would look at it. And I think the the final piece of that would be we still don't know what Marcus Freeman ultimately wants to do on defense. We know I'm confident in saying that in 2021, we're going to see more of a 4-2-5 alignment because he's going to build around what's already there. I'm curious to see if ultimately he may not want to be more of a 3-3-5. If you go to more of a 3-3-5, then now you can play more three more true linebackers. And now a guy like Jalen Sneed, guys like Nolan Ziegler become even more important because they're genuine hybrid linebackers that can can play in space and cover and do things like that, you know, from the same cloth as a Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa. Not saying they're as good as or athletic or anything like that. I'm simply saying their style of play is similar. So with guys like Jalen Sneed and Nolan Ziegler, you could go with a 3-3-5 stack where you've got three defensive linemen and then three linebackers stacked right behind them, and you've got three pure linebackers. But that third linebacker, that Sam linebacker, has to be capable of playing in the slot, playing outside, dropping into coverage, and doing things along those lines. So because in a 3-3-5, the way that Marcus Freeman did it at Cincinnati, that rover is no longer a rover. It's more of a safety. And so if they get to that point, so maybe you'd have three linebackers, then like a carry G playing that spot or something like that. <clears throat> I think those are some things that you would have to look at and and say, okay, that's 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 kind of where you are and and you feel like you got another guy and you can use those guys together, then you then you can if you can make it work numbers wise at other places, then then you make it work. So I hope that answers your question. If if not, then follow up and and I'll I'll answer it as a follow up. Jack Sullivan asks, do you see a world where Prince Colley starts at some point in 2021? Do you see him getting playing time uh, in the rotation in general? I, yeah, I could see a world. I mean, look, he's my number one ranked defensive player in the in the 2021 class. And that's saying a lot because I, I really like Gabriel Rubio and Ryan Barnes and Philip Riley as well. So does he have the talent to play as a freshman? Absolutely. It'll be hard, though. Uh, depending on what position he plays. If he projects more as an inside linebacker, then it'll be very hard because there's just so many experienced, talented players. If he can actually play Rover and be an every down Rover, then then I think he's going to have a really good chance to play because right now, who's your Rover? I mean, I, Paul Mawal is coming off of a major injury. Isaiah Pryor, to me, is not an every down line, you know, Rover type player. He's a situational guy. And maybe you move Jack Kaiser, and Jack Kaiser, I think, could thrive there. But but is he so good that you can't you can't see Prince Collie earning playing time? Maybe even starting? Certainly not. And and I think that says more about Prince Collie's talent than it does Jack Kaiser's because I like Jack Kaiser a lot. I graded him as a four star recruit coming out of high school. So I think as a rover, he could be a good player, assuming he can handle the coverage part of it. That's something we haven't seen him do a lot is the coverage aspect. Now, he was a free safety in high school, so I, I'd have to think he's got some coverage instincts, but we need to see him do it. And and even But even if he plays well, I think Prince Colley has a chance to play. I hope that the Notre Dame staff realizes that Prince Colley is probably not a five-year player and that they find a role for him on special teams. And if they do that, then that's going to increase the chances that he can find a role at linebacker as well. So... um Am I guaranteeing he's going to play this year? No. Uh, will I Will I predict him to start at some point in time, Jack? No. Would it shock me if at some point in time in 2021 that Prince Colley's starting or playing a lot? No. He's just that good of a player. 
All right. So <clears throat> let's see here. Um, uh, so Brandon Plencher asks, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm Plencher. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. I apologize if I'm, if I'm getting it wrong, Brandon, uh, Cooper Barkate or Jake Pope, better prospect in your opinion. This is an interesting Brandon because an interesting question, Brandon, because it depends on what you're looking for. So when I look at Cooper, when I look at Jake Pope, I think Jake Pope is a better pure safety than, than, uh, than Cooper is at this point in time. Because he plays safety, he's a little longer. He's he's just I know he can play that position. You watch Cooper in high school; he plays as much corner as he does safety, and he's not quite as big, in my opinion, as Jake Pope. I think Cooper, to me, is is the guy that I would view as the better all around prospect. Could play some slot corner. He could maybe be that nickel guy uh, when you're playing corner because he can flip his hips and run and cover. I mean, he's a really athletic kid. I'm curious to see how he performs at modern day this year. My understanding is based on an interview he did with Eric Rutter, who is our new recruiting guy at Irish Breakdown. It sounds like he's going to be playing mostly offense at modern day this year. I have to go back and read that article and make sure that I got that correctly, but it doesn't sound like he's going to be playing as much defense, but he's a kid that you could recruit and play some receiver as well. I mean, he he's, he's from the same cloth as guys like Xavier Watts and Lorenzo Styles and, and uh, you know, players, Jojo Johnson, of, of guys that are legitimate two-way players at college. Notre Dame has even talked to him about possibly being a two-way player at college. That's most likely going to be just something that they're doing to, to can entice him to come. But uh, So to me, better all-around player, I think, is Cooper. Better pure safety is Jake Pope. And so you have to decide, if you're only going to take one safety in this class, you need to take the more pure safety. If you're going to take more numbers in the secondary than you take a kid like Cooper Barkate and you, and you find a home for him because he's a really athletic football player. All right, Matty K, let's see here. Actually, that's a receiver question. We'll get back to that here in a little bit. Um, let's see here. Uh, so Connor Patton asked a question. This is interesting. What will be the fallout? What will the fallout be if all the top 2022 recruits for ND are defensive, save a couple Jeff Quinn guys? I don't know if there will be any. Are you talking about – so, so Connor, do me a favor and follow up with this. Are, are you talking about follow uh, – uh, are you talking about fallout from a, a standpoint of what would Coach Kelly's reaction be? Or are you more talking about fallout from a standpoint of, of what, you know, my reaction, the reaction of analysts and, and things like that? So um, – let me know kind of what you're talking about there and 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 I'll I'll follow up and answer that one. But I want to make sure I'm answering it the way that, that you're intending intending it to be. Um actually, you know what? I'll just do both. So I'll answer both. So don't worry about it. Number one, I think the fallout from a Coach Kelly standpoint is I don't know if there will be any fallout. I think the Coach Kelly has has made a, a we've seen this before, right? Autry Denson was a, a very, very mediocre to poor recruiter. Notre Dame recruited running back extremely well under Bernie Parmalee. They recruited it extremely well under Tony Alford, in my opinion. And they've now recruited it pretty well under under um, Lance Taylor, even though I don't think he's necessarily a great individual recruiter. He's good enough to get the job done with the help of, of other coaches. And obviously, Terry Joseph had a big role in getting Logan Diggs. Chip Long had a big role in getting, getting Chris Tyree, but they're getting the players. So, But we still saw Audrey Denson here for four years. And to me, he was a good running backs coach, but that is the easiest position of football to coach. And I know that from experience. My first full-time coaching job was as a running backs coach. I was like 23 years old, 24 years old, and I coached an All-American because he was really talented. And it's literally footwork and aiming points, protect the ball. It's not a super complicated position to recruit or to coach. So you should never sacrifice recruiting for a, a guy who's a good coach. You, you need to have a guy that can do both at Notre Dame. I think Lance Taylor has been an upgrade because he's not only a good coach, but he's a better recruiter. Now, I think there's another upgrade possible. The point being, we've seen it before. Coach Alexander has been a relatively mediocre recruiter uh, from a work ethic and production standpoint. If you look at the success at receiver the last couple of years, he was not the driving force behind most of that, vast majority of that. It was Chip Long and then Tommy Reese. And we saw no fallout from that. Scott Booker was a very mediocre recruiter and and a and not a great coach for years and Ryan Kelly didn't do anything about it until he had no choice. Brian Van Gorder was a terrible coach and a terrible recruiter and and Brian Kelly didn't do anything about that until he had no choice. The the program was falling apart. So we've 
we've seen him stick with mediocre recruiting coaches for a long time and and there and there's no fallout i think we we will there will there be any changes on off i don't think there will be i hope i'm wrong but i don't think there will be i think the response that that should be given from analysts is going to be to be critical of it because look if you look at the recruiting that Notre Dame predominantly did outside of, as you said, a couple Jeff Quinn guys, but even there, the depth of the O-line classes has not been as good. The third and fourth guys have not been as good under Jeff Quinn, and he hasn't even got a third or fourth guy in two of his three full classes. So I think that even there, there's some question marks. The tight end. Your, your last two tight end commits were Mitchell Evans and Jack Nichols. Solid prospects, but it's not the caliber of tight end that you're used to seeing. Notre Dame has not gotten a commitment. They've gotten a commitment from one receiver since Chip Long left, and that was Jaden Thomas. The last two quarterbacks that Notre Dame has landed has been Ron Paulus, who's a two-star recruit who could not have committed to another Power 5 school in the country, and Steve Angeli. He was a solid prospect, but not the caliber player you expect a program competing for championships to land. So there's a lot of concerning things going on with offensive recruiting, and we haven't seen Brian Kelly do anything about it. So I still don't think that there would be anything done about Plens Plensner. Okay, Brandon, thanks for, for clearing that up. I will definitely try to get that right from, from here on out. Appreciate you following up with that. So, Connor, I hope that answers your question. If not, if just clarify, you'll follow up, and I'll, and I'll get the question answered. Four Horsemen asks, uh, how might Kyle Hamilton be used differently under Marcus Freeman than under Clark Lee? This is a, a great question, and, and the answer is uh, I don't know, but I'm going to explain to you some ways that he could be used that and why I'm uncertain of it. So number one, Kyle Hamilton is, is a unique player in that he could do so many different things at a high level. If, if they just want to have, have him play straight free safety, middle of the field, cover one guy, he would be brilliant at it. He's so rangy. We saw that against Alabama. He'd get his hands on a lot of throws. He'd influence a lot of throws, meaning quarterbacks don't make throws because they're worried about him. If they wanted to turn him into a pure cover four alley safety, he would be great at that because he can tackle. He's instinctive. He gets downhill in a hurry. Um, he's a physical kid, even though he's on the skinny side. He's always been a big hitter from the moment he, he showed up on campus, and he's only going to get stronger. And he's a guy that I think if you moved him to Rover, would be an elite rover. I think if you moved him to rover, he would replicate Jeremiah Wusu's stats. I, I truly believe that. I think Kyle Hamilton's one of those guys that could do whatever the heck you want him to do. And if Notre Dame decided they wanted to to put him at rover in a in a true three three five, I think he'd be brilliant at it. I think he'd be a game changer at it. I think he'd have seventy five tackles, probably thirteen tackles for loss, and four or five sacks. I really think Kyle Hamilton would be that good at it because he's a pretty good blitzer even as a safety. The, the concern here is not about what he can or can't do. The question is, is how does the rest of the defense shape shape out? The issue with, with moving Kyle Hamilton to, to let's say like a rover position or, or more of a closer to the line of scrimmage player is there's bigger question marks about what then would be behind him. Safety is literally your last line of defense. And, and if you're not confident in the players behind him, then it kind of limits what you can do with him. So, you know, let's say, let's say that, that say one of the younger, say, let's say Litchfield Ajavon or KJ Wallace or, or, or Justin Walters, one of those younger players or two of them just had big time breakouts this spring. Like, wow, this kid can flat out play. These guys got to go on the field. Houston Griffith is everything that I think he is, and he's ready to be a breakout player. Then I think there's some things you could do with Kyle Hamilton in a three safety defense where he could be that guy that you just move all over. And you do a lot of different things with. He plays some rover. He plays almost like a hybrid linebacker. You have enough athleticism, a linebacker, to bump some guys out and kind of invert them a little bit and get real creative with how you view Kyle Hamilton. And the the, the benefit to that is he's your best player in 2022. Excuse me, 2021. And there's no doubt about it, in my opinion. He's your best defensive player by a by far. And that's that's just how good he is. Not that they don't have other excellent players. So then what is going to happen is teams are then going to game plan to avoid him. Well, last year that was really hard to do because you also had to game plan to avoid Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa, and they were often not on the same side of the field. So it was very hard to avoid Kyle Hamilton and Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa. Well, I don't know if there's that second player yet. Now, maybe Shane Simon becomes that, which we talked about. Maybe Isaiah Foskey becomes that. Maybe one of the safeties we talked about has a breakout and becomes that kind of guy. But right now that guy doesn't exist. 
So one of the things you can do as a defensive coordinator to counter that is to move him around more. So one snap, he's to the field. He's down, down, you know, down in the alley. Maybe he's over a slot. The next play, maybe you drop him in the middle of the field. The next play, maybe you have him in the boundary. You can kind of turn him into sort of that really versatile player where as an offense, you have no clue where he's going to line up. And I can bring him on pressures and blitzes and play him in coverage from all over the field. So I think it gives you a lot of flexibility with that should he be able to do that. But you can't do that without the players behind him being really good. Right now, it's a very unproven position. So I think it limits what you can do with him. You almost have to keep him on the back end as much as possible because of the fact that you just don't have great options besides him. So I think it it limits them. Now, depending on how we see things shake out in the spring, could change that. They might be more versatile to, with him. But as of right now, I, I don't know how much versatility they're going to be able to do with him based on the things we talked about because of those question marks at other positions. So I hope I hope that we see him other guys break out. Kyle Hamilton is able to do move all over because Houston Griffith steps up or KJ Wallace or Litchfield Ajavon or DJ Brown or Justin Walters. Maybe Kerry G comes in the fall, does a great job. He's ready to play. Maybe Philip Riley is just so good that he's ready to go make, play safety. Who who knows? There's a, there's options there, but until those guys break out, you can't you have to be real careful about how how much three safety looks you want to do. And then that also then limits how much you can move Kyle Hamilton. Because if you have to go to a four two five with a with more of a rover and you've only got two safeties on the field, it's going to really limit your ability to just really use him all over and be different with him, which was to your point. Uh, MT41 asks, what are your thoughts on the D end? Uh, that would be DJ Wezelak. I think he's a good football player. I, I think he's a, a top 200 to 250 caliber player. He's got great size. He's 6'6". Six, six. He's listed at like 220, 230. Really long arms. I think he's got a really nice vertical burst off the line. I think he's got some potential to be an edge, a, a good edge rusher. My only question, it's not a concern, it's more of a question, is where does he fit? I think he's kind of got the length and body that Notre Dame likes at that drop position, that Viper position. But I don't know if he's got the lateral quickness and if he's got the game to play that position. Uh, I think he projects, from what we see right now, I think all the other two ends, Tyson Ford and Aiden Gabera, both project as more of big ends. And I think DJ Wezelak does as well. So if the future of your defense is a 4-2-5 with a Viper that is going to look like what Dalen Hayes did, then taking DJ Wezelak is a little concerning for me because I don't know if you have a true Viper in that group. Now, here's the rub, or here's the flip side, the counter to that. If Notre Dame is going to go to more of a, a 3-3-5 in the future, and, and I think there's some evidence to suggest that could ultimately be what Marcus Freeman wants to do, then, then I take all three of them because now there is no true Viper. It, you have basically a big end and another big end. One of the big ends needs to be a guy capable of sliding into a three technique. Maybe that's Tyson Ford. And then DJ Wesselak and those other players can kind of play um, that other end position. So if they want to be more of a 3-3-5 team, you could even get in a situation where you really only have one end on the field, and that's your big end. And then your other end is more of a, a Riley Mills, Jason Adamiola type of guy, uh, an Anthony Lucas type of guy who's a Dud defensive tackle recruit in the 2022 class that Notre Dame is making a push for that could be a to me a just a game changing type of commitment if they were able to get him, which is going to be tough. But he's that guy that could be a great three technique. But he, you watch him in high school, he's got a really nice burst off the edge when he lines up as a defensive end. He's got great hands. He's long. He's a good athlete. He's a guy that could be a, a power end and a three down look and a four down look. He's a three technique that's just is is a bigger version of, of Jason Adamiola, which is saying something. He's a really impressive player. So um, so MT41, it just depends on what they're going to do. And maybe they view some current guys in the roster as, as maybe they don't like their strong side end production, and they maybe view Tyson Ford as a guy that is going to – he's already 255 pounds. Maybe they view him as a guy that's eventually going to – to grow into that bigger end guy that we talked about in the three-down look where he is the bigger player that can – get up to 275 and be a power end and then slide into three technique like they did at Cincinnati. Their, their other, their two ends in their three down look at Cincinnati 
One of them was 6'5", 250. That's very much in the Aiden Gabera, DJ Wesselak body type, Isaiah Foskey body, body type. Their other defensive end was 6'4", 275 pounds, both of them. And when they'd go to four down looks, those guys would move inside and play and play three technique. Well, Tyson Ford eventually could grow into that kind of guy where he's a in a three down look. He can be a five, a big powerful five technique that when you go four down at times could slide inside and, and be be a really disruptive three technique. You know, he's a to me a 20, he could potentially be a 20 pound, 25 pound bigger version of, of Adi Takumba Ogandiji. So I, I think that um that is an area where you could kind of see him uh, be some flexi- flexibility there. So uh, if they're going to do that, then I then take DJ Weselak. I like him a lot. If they're going to be more of a four-down team, however, I, I really think you need more of a a Cyrus Moss. Uh, you know, if you felt Devin Jackson could get up to 240 pounds, 245 pounds, that kind of athlete, the Will Schweitzers type of guys, the Dalen Hayes type of athletes, I think you need another one of those guys in this class as opposed to three – power ends but if they're not gonna if their future is not at that then then i'm okay with it but but just looking at him individually good football player and he has that you, you know mike elson loves length and he certainly has that length so um dj weselak is a kid that's a, a very very quality football player i just want to see you know the fit is really the only question mark that i have there see any more defensive questions uh jack sullivan here we go let's see what you got in these only three 2021 signees with clemson offers were dbs in 2022 golden martinez have clemson offers and the irish look good for both uh what's that say about uh defensive recruiting in your opinion i think it says that mike mickens is a darn good football coach and a darn good recruiter I, the thing i love about him and we've seen it from marcus freeman since he's been ar- around is they're not afraid to go after the big boys when you when you look at when he got involved with Ryan Barnes, he already had Clemson offers. He, he had LSU offer. He had offers from all over the country, and and they got in and said, "So what? We're going after him." And they got him. You know, Philip Riley's in Florida, and he's got all these SEC schools making a run at him. USC's making a run at him. Clemson offered him, and they went and got him. And, and look, you're going to lose every single battle against the big boys that you don't you don't fight. Every single one, you have to fight to have a chance to win. And I think what this says about Mike Mickens is, is he's willing to go toe to toe. Now he's going to lose some right now. I'd say he's probably not going to win the battle of Toriano pride. Who's right now likes Clemson, Ohio state and Alabama more than he likes Notre Dame. Maybe he can overcome that and get back in that mix, but he's fighting the fight, right? He's not backing down. He's going to look, when you go against the big boys, you're going to, you're going to lose more often than not. But the, the, the objective is to win enough to where you're landing that one, two, three difference makers a year that you're currently not getting. That's the difference between Notre Dame being what it's been, which is really good, and Notre Dame taking that final step. It's one or two guys a year total. That's it. And you start getting those guys, and so you're starting to see him get those players. And that's what I like about Mike Mickens, and that's what I like about Marcus Freeman. Now, Marcus Freeman has to show that he can close, which we haven't seen him do yet with any linebackers. I think he will. It just hasn't happened yet. Whereas, whereas Mark Mike Mickens has that extra year under his belt where he's shown that he can he can close. So here we go. Uh, another defensive question. Thomas Walsh asks if Jacob Lacey's healthy, is he going to get increased snaps, or does Heinish coming back hurt his snaps? His freshman year, there were times he was super impressive. I agree. When Jacob Lacey's been healthy, he's been a really good football player. He was very banged up this past season. Uh, we have a we had a uh, we talked about that in our podcast yesterday where. That's going to be the key. I mean, right now, Howard Cross is getting more snaps than him because of the injuries. I, I think in an ideal world, you want Jacob Lacey healthy because the, I think the staff is at the point now where they don't want to have to play Kurt Heinish 50-plus snaps a game because he's better when he can only play 30 to, to 40. He's better in the fourth quarter. He's better in November when he doesn't have to play as many snaps week after week because he's not a natural 300, 295-pound guy. He's more of a I mean, if we're being honest, he's probably more natural at 270, 275. So when you have a guy that's carrying 20 extra pounds and what his body is meant to handle, and he's got to play 50, 60 snaps a game, he's going to wear down. And so if a guy like Jacob Lacey can stay healthy and give you 20, 25 really hard snaps a game, and Howard Cross can maybe give you five or 10 fast athletic snaps a game, and now Jacob, you know, Kurt Heinish is at 30 to 40 snaps a game, you're going to have a really, really good nose tackle situation. So I think it's the other way around. I don't think Kurt Heinisch coming back hurts Jacob Lacey. I think Jacob Lacey being healthy would help Kurt Heinisch 
and then of course would help Jacob Lacey. And that's kind of how I see that. So that's why I think it's so important that he does get and stay healthy because he could be a, a difference maker for them in a lot of different ways. Benjamin Perry asks, will Freeman will, will Freeman give young guys a fair shake on D-line or will Myron and Heinish get preferred reps as veteran players we've seen in the past? I, you know, I, I think we've seen in the last couple of years, especially we're seeing more and more from Notre Dame playing younger players. And I think it's only going to take a jump with Marcus Freeman. He has not been afraid to play younger players at Cincinnati. He, from what I've been told from talking to different sources, he very much has a mentality of really, there are no returning starters because this is a new defense, right? I'm a new coach. Everyone's going to get a fair shake and he has no problem playing younger guys that are able to execute. He's one of those coaches that comes from the if this young kid can only do one thing, but he can do that one thing really well, we're going to find a home for him. So I don't think that they're, it's going to necessarily be preferred reps. I think the reason that they're moving Myron Tungvaloa to, to big end, which is what we're hearing that they're doing, is because they see Jason Adamiola and Riley Mills and Gabe Rubio as just too good not to play more. And strong, you know, the big end position is a little bit more of a question mark. So, you know, if Gabe Rubio comes in and he's one of the two best defensive tackles, he's going to play. If, if Will Schweitzer comes in or if Jason Onye comes in and they're one of the two better players of that position, they're going to play. Same thing at, at, in the se secondary. From the sources I've talked to, Philip Riley and Ryan Barnes this spring are going to get every opportunity to crack the rotation because, they're, again, there's no one that's been so good that other than Kyle Hamilton that you're like, that guy's not going to – that guy's not coming off the field. You know, Justin Walters is going to get that shot. So Prince Colley, when he shows up in the fall, will get that shot. JoJo will get that shot. Chance Tucker will get that shot. So – I do believe, Benjamin, that on defense, we're going to see the younger players get an opportunity. And if they step up and show that, hey, I can help this defense, then they'll find a home for them. If they don't, they've got a lot of really good veteran players coming back. And Kurt Heinis was a really good football player last year. He had seven and a half tackles for loss. That's only a, a one and a half less tackles for loss in one fewer game than what Jerry Tillery had as the nose guard in 2017. He was a pretty good player that year. That was the year before his All-American breakout season. So, yeah, I think you'll see plenty of young guys get a shot. Matty K asks, uh, 55 asks, would Freeman be creative enough to try some 3-4 looks, or does the type of linebackers we recruit prohibit it, uh, enhance this possibility? If you mean by 3-4 like a traditional 3-4 defense where you have two 5 techniques and then and then two 9 techniques that are kind of stand-up outside linebackers like we saw in 2012, 2010 to 2013, no, I don't think we're going to see that. I don't think that defense works real well in today's era of football. You cannot run that defense against Alabama or Clemson or Ohio State. It just won't work. You can't have seven big guys on the field the way that Notre Dame did back in twenty seven, back in 2012. Could we see a 3-4 defense from a personnel standpoint? Yes. I think we definitely could see that. And what I mean by that is sort of a, a three-down lineman and four linebackers. So you have a 3-3-5 three, three, alignment where you have the three-down lineman and then let's say – uh, you, you have Mike, you know, you have uh, Drew White as a Sam, you have uh, Shane Simon as the Buck, or Maris Lufau as a Sam, any of those guys, Bo Bauer at Mike, or Drew White at Mike, some combination of those three. And then you have Jack Kaiser, Paul Mawala playing a rover, Prince Colley playing that rover position. So you're in 3 4 personnel, but you're playing a 3 3 5 defense, sort of like Notre Dame, the last really, it, with the exception of 2018. Notre Dame has been a 4-3 defense personnel-wise since Mike Elko and Clark Lee arrived. It's a 4-2-5 defense from an alignment standpoint. It's not a 4-2-5 defense from a personnel standpoint. 2018, when they had when they had Sean Crawford and you had Houston Griffith and Nick Coleman. Actually, no, Sean Crawford was hurt that year. You had Nick Coleman. You had Houston Griffith playing a lot of that, that nickel spot. Osmar Bilal would play it when they played more pro-style teams. That was a 4-2-5, pure 4-2-5. 17 with Drew Tranquil at Rover. That was a 4-3 defense that lined up in 4-2-5 alignments. 2019 with uh, – we saw the same thing. We saw 2019 with Jeremiah wusu Koromoa. That's a 4-3 defense in 4-2-5 alignments, and same thing in 2020. So personnel-wise, they were a 4-3 that played a 4-2-5. In this situation, I could see a 3-3-5 a alignment in scheme with 3-4 personnel. When you have an athletic guy like a Jack Kaiser, like Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa, like Prince Kali, you can you can be part of uh, you can run the three three five in in the in bigger personnel, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to stack up better against teams that really run the football effectively. 
And so I think that uh, that happens. So uh, Matty K followed up with the second part is what I meant having four linebackers, not necessarily a pass rush, but more for pass coverage and screen coverage. So, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about like more more personnel as opposed to a three, four alignment, then yes, absolutely. I think we will see that. And in, in fact, this year uh, I could I could see situations where they go three, three, five in four, three personnel where you maybe drop Isaiah Foskey at linebacker and kind of move him around and bring him. So schematically, we will not see a three, four defense. Personnel wise, could we see a three four defense? I'd be shocked if we don't see it at times. And there's a chance maybe at some point it becomes the the base defense personnel wise. Again, personnel wise, not alignment wise. I don't think we'll see a three four you know look that we've seen from you know past teams. I think that is gone. Alabama doesn't even really do that that much except when they're playing again. You're playing old school Stanford. You can easily adjust to that. You just sub some guys out, and you can you can see that in those situations. But that would be a unique matchup situation against a specific type of defense. All right, we got some more questions. Uh, we got some offensive questions. I'm going to go work through those for y'all here a little bit. Um, Ryan Bonk asks. Uh, I know this is supposed to be a defensive show, but Steve Wolfong from 24/7 Sports posted Gavin Wims at top three is Kentucky, Cincinnati, and Rutgers. Are there any words to come up with? Why Notre Dame wouldn't push for this guy? Um, I, I I honestly don't know. I, I really think when it comes down to it, Notre Dame does not want that type of quarterback. It's why they pushed out Phil Dracovic. It, you know, Tyler Buckner can can be a run throw guy, but Tyler Buckner is a really good pocket passing quarterback who happens to be athletic. Notre Dame wants a quarterback that's just going to be a sit in the pocket kind of guy. I think the the gap between Gavin Wimsett and and Steve Angeli is enormous. Now, what we don't know is we don't know if there's some other reasons why they're they're not pushing for Gavin Wimsett. You know, I like Gavin Wimsett a lot. I think he's ranked as a top fifty player. I think that's the kind of talent he has. But his final three is Kentucky, Cincinnati, and Rutgers. That makes me think that there might be something else there that's causing teams like Notre Dame uh, and, and other big programs not to push for him. So I think that's a fair question to say, is there more to it that we don't know? And I think we always have to, even you know, as critical as I am of this decision, to say you at least have to be open-minded enough to say that there's more to the Gavin Wimsett situation than maybe we know. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just some of these schools aren't willing to take a kid as raw as Gavin Wimsett. I, I think he's a really talented quarterback, and I think he can be a pocket passer. I think when you watch him play, He's a guy that, to me, is willing to sit in the pocket. And when he starts running around, he's running around with his eyes downfield. He likes to throw the ball. He's more of a, a to me, a drop-back quarterback who is athletic as opposed to a run-throw quarterback who's got to learn to throw the football. All right, see, um, see if we have any more offensive questions here. I, I did know that we saw some. Uh, let's see here. Bear with me. Um And if you have any more defensive questions, f- please feel free to uh, to leave them at the bottom. We have not quite wrapped up yet. Um, oh, here's a defensive question. I did not see this, Maddie. I'm sorry. How good on the scale of average to elite, in your opinion, could the linebacker class be in 2022 if we get some of the linebackers we've offered? If Notre Dame signs three to four of the linebackers that we've talked about in this show, so that is obviously Nolan Ziegler is already in the class. It's a big pickup. He's a top 200 caliber player. Junior Tui Alamaka, Sebastian Cheeks, Josh Burnham, Jalen Sneed, Harold Perkins, uh, Sean Murphy. Those, those are the guys that I kind of look as like the guys you'd take right now. If they get any three to four man combination of any of those linebackers, that I don't think there's going to be a team in the country that's going to have a better linebacker class. That is an elite linebacker class. I would argue that's even better than the 2018 linebacker class, which at the time coming out of high school was an outstanding linebacker class. You had Jack Lamb, who was a top 100 recruit. You had Shane Simon, who was a top 100 recruit. Bo Bauer was a top 200 recruit. And then you had Ovia Gofu, who ended up being a defensive end. This would be the best linebacker class of the Brian Kelly era, and I don't think it would be close. That's how – and I'm not even talking about just recruiting rankings. From a recruiting ranking standpoint, it would be. Most of those guys are top 100 players. I'm simply looking at it from evaluating the film. If you get any combination of those three or four guys, this is this is as good of a linebacker class as you're going to get, and there's versatility there too. It's not four guys that are this, play the same position. It would be a really, really good linebacker class. 
Corey Norman asks, what offenses on the 2021 schedule will give the defense the most trouble? Which ones are the best or easiest matchups? Corey, that's a good question. I think some offenses that could give Notre Dame some problems. Uh, I'm going to pull up the 2021 schedule here real quick. Um, let's see here. I, I know that – so for me, the Wisconsin game is is not one that I'm overly concerned about, if I'm if I'm being honest. I don't think that offenses like that have, have really given Notre Dame problems. I think – when you look at like Wisconsin, I'm more concerned about their defense matching up against Notre Dame and them winning a, a low-scoring game. I think, number one, you look at the schedule and you find any team with a mobile quarterback because until they can prove they can handle mobile quarterbacks more effectively than they have in the past, that's a concern. I think the Georgia Tech offense is going to be better than people think. It, it than people think. They had two freshmen this year, quarterback and running back, Jeff Sims and Jameer Gibbs, who are studs. That talent level is increasingly improving. They've landed a lot of transfers the last couple of years. I think that's going to be a more dangerous team than people think. Uh, Purdue is an interesting one. They had to play a lot of young players this past season. Uh, they have had a lot of injured players. They've recruited relatively well. Jeff Brom, I think, is a tremendous offensive mind. And if they can figure out the offensive line, that's a that's an offense that could provide some problems there. That pro style, really spread it out offense could could provide some problems. Cincinnati's going to have a very talented offense this year. They get back almost everybody. Desmond Ritter's a really good run throw quarterback. Uh, they're going to be familiar with the system because it's there's a lot of things Mike Dembrock is doing there that that he's done in the past at Notre Dame. Obviously, he's someone Brian Kelly's very familiar with, having been Notre Dame's former offensive coordinator. That's an offense with some talent. Michael Young really came on strong the second half of the year. They've got some talented players, talented running backs. They bring back most of their offensive linemen, I believe. Virginia Tech, to me, is not a concern. Um, Navy is not a concern. Virginia's not really concerned. Stanford losing Davis Mills going pro crushed their chance to have a good offense. And also, Semi Fahoku also went pro. They're going to have some really good receivers and some really good running backs, but their offensive line and quarterback position uh, would concern me if I was a Stanford fan. To me, the, the toughest matchups are going to be back-to-back -back games in October. October 23rd, they play USC, and October 30th, they play North Carolina, both at home. And I think to me, those are the two best offenses on on the schedule. And I think those are those are two offenses that Notre Dame can handle, but they're they're going to be a challenge. I think USC they're going to have a third year starting quarterback. I think that they gave some Notre Dame some problems in twenty eighteen, excuse me, twenty nineteen, moving the ball uh, against them that year. They kind of started to figure the Notre Dame defense out in the second half and just really kind of scored at will against them. Even though they lost Tyler Vaughn's and Amon Ross St. Brown, they bring back some really talented receivers. Drake Drake London is a really talented guy. They have plenty of weapons. The offensive line took some hits. Losing Elijah Vera Tucker hurts them. So to me, that's going to be the big question mark is, can the offensive line hold up against what I think is going to be a really good Notre Dame pass rush? If Notre Dame can control the line of scrimmage, then they'll beat USC. But if Notre Dame can't get after the quarterback or if – if USC starts, you know, popping some runs on them and kind of forces Notre Dame to condense their defense a little bit, then I think that's gonna that that could be where they could have some problems. And that's what they did to Notre Dame in the second half in 2019. They just started running inside zone and draws, and they forced Notre Dame to condense the defense, which then allowed them to to kind of work backwards and, and start getting the ball outside. Normally, they want to get the ball outside and and pop some stuff over the middle, but it, the second half against Notre Dame, they they kind of went in reverse because Notre Dame was just stopping their shutting down their perimeter stuff so effectively. So I think that that that's a those those two and look North Carolina loses a lot, you know, the, the Army Brown was outstanding. They lost a pair of thousand yard running backs, but Sam Howell's an outstanding player. He is an outstanding quarterback. He is the trigger man that's going to make that happen. So I think getting him back helps. They have I think four starting offensive linemen coming back. They got a really good grad transfer from Cincinnati, Ty Chandler, who who is back. Uh, they had an, a freshman a receiver this year, uh, named also named Brown, that is a really good player. And then Bo Corrales comes back. Bo Corrales is a really good football player. He had 40 catches for 575 yards and six touchdowns in 2019. Uh, he went down after five games this year uh, and had you know 13 catches for 238 yards. He's a good football player. He's a big athletic kid, 6'3 plus. So there's going to be weapons there. It's a really good scheme under Paul Longo. Uh, that is is going to put you some challenges, and they're going to be a little ticked off because Notre Dame did such a great job shutting them down this year. So um, I think that that North Carolina is still going to be a test and a challenge. So, but it's but beyond really talent wise, USC, North Carolina, and Cincinnati are really the only three offenses that concern me top to bottom talent wise. 
Georgia Tech concerns me because of that dynamic one-two punch in the backfield and Jeff Sims and Jameer Gibbs. And then Purdue, Purdue concerns me from a coaching standpoint, not so much from a talent standpoint. So um, th th that's kind of how I break down break down their defense. All right, let's work through here. Um, any more questions? This great questions today, guys and gals. I really appreciate it. Really good stuff. Let me see if there's anything else that we uh, we need to get to here. Um, all right, Connor, I see that. So I did answer that question. Appreciate that. All right. Oh, uh, here's a special teams question. All right. Actually, let's go here. Uh, Connor follows up. That's the crazy thing. Some days I think Notre Dame will go 11 and one and other days. I think they'll go eight and four. Honestly, I think the days of Notre Dame going eight and four are gone. I, I, I think, I think that would shock me. I think one thing that coach Kelly has just done a tremendous job of is they don't lose to teams that they're not supposed to lose to anymore. Here's a, here's an amazing stat for you. If you take out 2016, go back to 2015 and then 17 to 20. Off top, I'm going to check this. I may be off a game or two, but if my numbers are correct, Notre Dame is 51 and 0 against teams that finish unranked. 51 and 0 against teams that have finished unranked. That tell you know that's what I've said about Coach Kelly. You're not losing to Tulsa anymore. You're not losing to Northwestern anymore. You're not losing to you know the teams that you're not supposed to lose to anymore. And, and I think that is a, that's an encouraging thing that that you say you know you, you're not going to lose those games. And to me, there's not enough good teams on the schedule that if Notre Dame just keeps doing what they're doing, they're going to beat nine to ten teams on the schedule. You know, so we talked about, you know, let's say the four toughest games are Wisconsin, Cincinnati, USC, and North Carolina. Those are the only four teams that you could even remotely contend can match Notre Dame talent-wise. They'd have to go 0-4 against those two, those four teams to to go eight and four. And, and I don't even see them going one and three against those teams. I think they'll at worst go two and two against those teams. So then if you do that, you'd have to lose two games that we just have not seen them lose in the last four years. And I just I don't I don't see that happening. I think the coaching on defense is going to be too good. I think the defense is, and that's really been the key is the the defense the last few seasons. The offense had to outscore some people in 2015. The last four years, it's been about the defense. Just opponents can't stop, can't score enough points to upset Notre Dame, and so the offense doesn't have to be as good. Now the question is, how are they going to be when it comes to playing the better teams in the schedule? If you look at that same stretch. Notre Dame is 10 and 8 from 17 to 20. That number is even worse if you add the the 2015 season in, but we won't for the because I think this is post 2016 makeover. They're 10 and 8 against opponents to finish ranked in the top 25. And you want to know why I've been critical of Brian Kelly for all the great things he's done? It's that stat right there. They're 10 and 8. And here's the thing: four of those games came in 2017. So you look at it and say, in in 2018 they went three and one against top 25 teams. They beat Michigan, they beat Northwest, Northwestern and Syracuse, and then lost to Clemson. And since that Clemson game, if you look at it, in Notre Dame's last, so they went two and two this year against top 25 teams, one and two in the year before. Notre Dame is three and five in their last eight games against opponents that finished ranked in the top 25. That that's not good enough. That's you you got to be better. The good news for Notre Dame has been they haven't played a lot of top 25 teams. And so I think that's going to help them out a little bit. Robert, uh I'm going to add here we go. Robert P. Uh will John the door be pushed this year from the talented freshman Josh Bryan coming in? Will he be pushed? No, I don't think he'll be pushed. Having said that, if he has a mental collapse, then he could get replaced. I, I think if John the door just is what he was last year, he'll still be the kicker. I, I don't I don't think he'll get replaced. I think if he has sort of a meltdown, which is always possible with kickers, then I think he could get replaced. I uh, Look, I, I hope that everyone gets challenged. I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think Josh Bryan was necessarily recruited to come in and push down the door. I think it was, let's take advantage of a year where we're going to have an additional scholarship and bring him in a year early than we would have normally brought in a kicker uh, to, to, so we can get him a year of, of experience. He can take a red shirt and then take over in 2022. Uh, so I think as long as you avoid, um, avoid that meltdown, I think we're, we're, we're gonna, I think we'll see him as the kicker. Michael Morris asks, do you think BK is going to cut Tommy Reese loose this year? All right, Michael, I'm going to ask that question again. Michael Morris asks, do you think BK is going to cut Tommy Reese loose this year? 
do I think he's going to do it? No, I don't think he's going to do it. I hope he does it. And and the reason I say that is, is because I think Tommy Reese is a really smart young coach. I have made my opinion of whether that not, not they should have hired him the, the year that they did, the time that they did, I did not think that was the right hire for a, a lot of reasons that, that were proven this season. But my concern was never about does he have the chops to eventually become a really good offensive coordinator. I think Tommy Reese is a really smart coach. I would like to see Coach Kelly turn him loose because I think if you said to Co- if Tommy Reese, hey, Tommy, I want you to go spend time with all the best offenses and I want you to figure out what they're doing philosophically, not schematically, philosophically, that's so allowing them to score the way that they're doing, how they use their personnel, how they attack defenses, how they practice. That's a big part of it. You know, what are the things they do in the weight room to allow them to be such an up tempo, you know, run a lot of plays offense at such a high speed? I think you have to practice really fast. Notre Dame does not practice super fast on offense. Your schemes have to be built around speed. I've heard Lincoln Riley talk about how he does not run routes where guys stop. Now, that's not technically true. I've seen a couple, but most of the stuff that they do, their guys are always on the move. Steve Sarkeesian has said this, and that's pretty accurate. Uh, at USC, they or at uh, Alabama, they hardly have any routes where guys like run curls or stops. It is all movement. Because his his response was great. I saw him do a video on this. I, somebody sent me a, a video he did before this past offseason. And he said, he basically said, me and Julio Jones run the same speed when he stopped. Right? You know, use use that speed. And and so, I, you know, there's Notre Dame runs a lot of routes where they have to stop. They have a lot of horizontal stuff. They do, especially in the red zone. They do more horizontal stretching in the red zone than any team I watch. And I think that's part of the reason – that they weren't effective in the red zone this past season because it's stopped. And when you stop, the defense can now match you speed for speed when you're running a curl route or a stop route. So those are things that you study, not specifically the scheme, but the philosophy behind the scheme. And then turn Tommy Reese loose to, to manipulate the offensive system that you've given him. You take the schemes, the alignments, all the different terminology that you use, and then you enhance it with these other concepts, RPOs. You know, more more speed routes, more routes where you're mixing up your formation. Spread the field more. Even with tight ends, spread the field more. Use your backs more effectively. All, doing all those kind of things. If Coach if Coach Kelly turns Coach Reese loose, Michael, to answer your question, I think this offense can see a huge jump. If if he turns Tommy Reese loose and says to Tommy, "Look, this is your offense. Here's what I'm looking for. Okay, I want to see this, this, and this, and this." like he did with Mike Elko and Clark Lee, then I absolutely believe this offense could take the next step and do it now. I'm talking 2021. They could do it now. I have a lot of confidence that Tommy Reese can be that guy moving forward. I didn't feel he was that guy in 2020. My opinion is not going to change on that. But the thing I said at the time was, let him learn under Joe Moorhead for two years and then take over, and I'm excited about what he can do. So there was always confidence in Tommy Reese from a down-the-road standpoint. Why not now? Look, you've got 2022. You've got Ohio State, Clemson, USC. You've got a you got a bull of a of a schedule. You need to have a year where you're building towards that. And with the talent you have on coming back on your roster, the fact that your offensive line is not going to be a proven offensive line. They just lost Chris Watt, who had a big role in the success of 2020. You're going to have four new starting offensive linemen. Run a system that's going to protect them more. RPOs protect them. Speed protects them. Screen game protects them. Tempo protects them. Now's the time to do it. And then if you can go into 2022 with a year under your belt of running this offense with four to five starting offensive linemen returning, all of your skill players coming back except for Avery Davis, all of them coming back, maybe they lose Kyron Williams, which I think they'd be, 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 be okay with. If he has a big year in 2021 and he goes pro, you're happy for him. You still feel good about your running back situation. So I think that that – Turning him loose now would see a big jump this year against a schedule that's not loaded with a lot of great defenses. There's a couple. Wisconsin's going to have a really good defense. Cincinnati's going to have a really good defense. But there's not going to be a lot of good defenses. You could score a lot of points. It'll turn the offense loose. You'll match up better in the postseason with the bigger teams. And it puts you in position in 2022 to take that next step where you could be really, really dynamic. Um. MT41, I appreciate that comment. I do. I really appreciate that you uh, listen to our show and watch our show and read our site. It really, really means a lot to have those those kind words. Um, Brandon Plenzer, 
Uh, has there any been any chatter uh, with recruits about Notre Dame's offensive scheme and it will be evolving into a more explosive up-tempo or more pass-heavy philosophy? Yeah, there actually has. I've seen several quotes. Uh, we've had some uh, – Eric Rudder had some where he's talked to some guys. I've had people send me um, like screenshots of what other people have, have been writing about. I don't have time to read other people's stuff, uh, but people will send it to me, and it's encouraging to hear what he's saying. That's great, but – I have learned in the 15 years of doing this, but then also coaching football that you don't always believe um, you don't always believe what you hear about those kind of things. We've heard things in the past that never come to fruition. If this is accurate and they are going to open up the offense um, and, and one recruit, I'm trying to remember who it was, but uh, one recruit Eric told Eric Rudder that, you know, he plans to throw it all around next year. That's great. That's great. Because you're still going to run the ball, but if you're going to, if you, that tells me that they're thinking about opening it up now, is that just chatter to try to get a receiver to come? Um, but uh, Plensner, all right, uh, Plensner, I'm going to get it eventually. You keep asking questions, I'm going to eventually get it. Um, so I think that would be great for Notre Dame. I think that would be awesome for Notre Dame. And if it's if they back up what they're telling recruits, then I think that's not only going to be six, result in success on the field, I think that's also going to result in success on the recruiting trail. So maybe some of these kids that you're losing now, if you go out in the fall and you open it up and you throw the ball around, now you can flip some of those guys. Because recruiting doesn't end just because a kid committed somewhere else. All right, so um, I think that's it. As a good show, we went way long, but lots of great questions. I appreciate y'all once again being part of the show. Uh, if you have ideas, topics you'd like to see us address in future mailbags, I'd like to start keeping these as kind of uh, narrow as, as possible, but we'll always open it up to all types of things. Let us know. You can get me on Twitter at CoachD178. You can shoot me an email at brian at irishbreakdown.com. You can leave a message on our community board at um, – uh, on our YouTube channel, we actually have a community board now. And so, um, you know, I think that's something that you can you can leave some questions there as well. Uh, and you can also leave questions on our on our Facebook fan page. If you have not joined, if you're on Facebook and you're not joined the Irish Breakdown Notre Dame fan page, please do so. Uh, we have a lot of conversation there. We're finding other ways to have conversation because we have an absence of a message board on our website. So um, that's kind of where uh, where we are. So. Let's see here. All right. I think that's it. So, hey, appreciate everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. We will uh, be back on Monday. Vince will be back on Monday. We'll have our podcast, and we may have a couple other podcasts coming up this weekend. I'm trying to work on getting some different guests to talk about some different topics because we want to try to keep it fresh and not always just me or, or Vince. If you didn't see it yet, we had Jim Mora, former head coach of the Atlanta Falcons, Seattle Seahawks, and UCLA Bruins. Uh, on our podcast recently, we have video of it and a podcast where he broke down Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa and Dalen Hayes. Uh, we're going to have a recruiting prod podcast coming up here real soon with Brian Smith, and I'm working on trying to get some more uh, some more guests so we can keep it fresh for you guys. So, um, so that's it. So appreciate y'all being with me. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Enjoy the nice weather that's finally coming around, and we will talk to you again soon.